Okay, I think we're ready to do a restart here. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, for those of you who weren't here to hear me try to start this off earlier, I'll just repeat this brief little blurb. Scott Horton is the editorial director of antiwar.com. He's gonna be delivering a lecture about the US involvement in the war in Ukraine. Scott has conducted over 6,000 interviews with anti-war pr pr proponents since 2003, most of which are available on YouTube. He's authored several books, among them Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and is co-author of the forthcoming book Provoked, America's Role in the U.S.-Ukraine War. Scott's articles have appeared at antiwar.com, the History News Network, and the Christian Science Monitor. He was featured in the 2019 documentary An Endless War Getting Out of Afghanistan. And in 2007, Scott won the Austin Chronicles Best of Austin Award for his Iraq War coverage on Antiwar Radio. Having said all that, take it away, Scott. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, as I was saying before, it's the kiss of death. I shouldn't do this, but I really am going to try very hard to do sort of the bullet point version of this story and then open it up for questions rather than, um, you know, laboring on and on. If people want, you know, the real written out detailed version of this lecture, it just go to antiwar.com slash Scott. And my latest piece is actually still from February uh, or early March. Um, the history behind the Russia-Ukraine war. And there I have all the quotes and all the sourcing and all of that for you here. Um, but just very quickly to start us off here, at the time that we're recording this on October the 1st, I think, right? Second? Yep. What the hell is it? It's the first, right? Yeah. On October the 1st, 2022, um, we're as close to nuclear war as we've been, or closer to nuclear war than we've been at any time since 1983 or 1962. In 83, it was, you know, the height of the Reagan buildup, uh, placing mid-range missiles in Europe and the able archer exercise and all that. And of course, 62 was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we almost went to thermonuclear war over the Soviet's installation of nuclear missiles in Cuba. Um, right now, we're fighting a proxy war with Russia right on their border. And instead of racing to negotiate, we're racing to pour weapons in there and make the war worse for the Russians as the stated goal. Um, and of course, the Russians have uh, played their role. They're the ones who launched this invasion. And as we're going to discuss, it was provoked, not unprovoked, but it's still essentially an aggressive war launched by them. And just in the last few days, as we're recording this, with a turn of phrase, the Russians have now escalated the situation in the war terribly by officially annexing these four major provinces, oblasts, they call them, in eastern Ukraine in a way that they are saying th these are all now officially part of Russia again, like in the days of the old Russian Empire uh, before the Soviet Union. Uh, but in a way where obviously the Americans and their Ukrainian allies and their other European allies absolutely will not recognize that. Say, no, that's Ukrainian territory simply occupied by you and will continue to fight on it. But that's different than how it's been for the last six months fighting the Russians on Ukrainian soil. Now it's, according to the Russians, officially Russian soil, which means that the consequences of continuing the war as before from the Ukrainian side could be much more severe and including they have threatened to use nuclear weapons. So don't anyone misunderstand me like what I'm saying here is that the Russians are the good guys in this or anything like that. They are the aggressors in this war. The reality is it's the Americans who have created this new cold war with Russia and the entire context of the situation in which they are making these horrible decisions that they're making. And the Americans and their allies bear major responsibility for that. So here's your bullet points. Despite all the denials, Bush Sr. and his government 
and all of their Western European allies, including the English, all swore over and over again they would not expand NATO east of Germany or even at begin in the beginning, even into East Germany, if the Soviets would withdraw their forces from Eastern Europe. And so they did so. And it was only in that context that Gorbachev would have done so. And um, because of the essentially soft touch of the Bush administration, Bush senior, they were actually trying to save the Soviet Union. That actually allowed the Soviet Union to dissolve. Um, whereas if they had pushed harder, they probably would have provoked a worse backlash and maybe had saved the last pieces of the USSR. Said the whole thing was gone by 1991. Well, the Clinton government comes in and in conspiracy with the Republicans led by Newt Gingrich in the Congress, they expanded NATO and first to Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic. Um, and then of course, uh, later it went further, but this was in direct violation of the promise to Russia, but they promised, well, we won't put our troops in there. We won't move any military equipment into the new NATO countries. That was in 1997, they promised that and immediately broke that. Under the Clinton government, they also sent the Harvard boys to destroy the Russian economy in the name of trying to save it and convert it to capitalism. They actually just looted the thing uh, through cronyism and ruined it. And they fought two major wars, well, relatively major wars uh, for the situation against the Russians, very close allies, the Serbs in Yugoslavia and the breakup of Yugoslavia in 1994, 95, and then in the war to break off Kosovo in 1999. And in all, in both of those cases, they backed the Mujahideen, essentially bin Ladenite fighters left over from the Afghan war of the 1980s against the Serbs. And the same was the case in Chechnya as well um, in the Clinton years. Then W. Bush comes in, tears up the anti-ballistic missile treaty and starts this program to put anti-missile missiles in Romania and Poland, which um, the thing about that is one, if they work as advertised, that helps to create a first strike capability. It tips the balance away from mutually assured destruction toward our ability to hit them first and also shoot down any retaliatory strike that they might have left so that we think we could get away with launching a preemptive nuclear war against Russia and prevailing in it. Um, and then even if they don't work as advertised, well, we're shooting those missiles out of the Mark 41 or MK 41 dual use missile launchers, Aegis onshore missile launchers that can be used to fire Tomahawk cruise missiles, which of course can be tipped with hydrogen bombs. And so this is at least in violation of the spirit of the intermediate nuclear forces treaty as well as uh, the ABM treaty, which Bush had torn up officially in 2001. Uh, he also expanded NATO by, I forget if it's seven or nine nations, and including the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and uh, Latvia and Estonia, both of which border Russia, and Lithuania, which sort of does, it's just right there nestled between Poland and Belarus, um, but still right there, you know, essentially right up on Russia's border. And Bush also had this policy of the color-coded revolutions. This really started under Bill Clinton, but under Clinton, it was the, um, they actually tried in Albania in like 94, 95, but I think the, the big one under uh, Clinton was in 2000, the overthrow of Slobodan Milosevic. Then under Bush in 2003, they did the Rose Revolution in Georgia. In Ukraine in 2004, they did the uh, Orange Revolution. In 2005 was the failed denim revolution in Belarus, and then the somewhat successful, temporarily successful lemon or pink revolution in Kyrgyzstan of all places. Then they went on to Lebanon with the Ceda revolution in 2005. Later, you all remember the green revolution in Iran in 2009. Not that that exactly counts, but it was the same sort of operation. Not that that was really against the Russians' interests as much as just the Ayatollah. Um, but um, so this is a huge provocation, of course, on the part of W. Bush in all these color-coded revolutions. Then Barack Obama comes in and he's, there's a few things here. The first thing is the war in Libya, where at that time Putin was sitting out of power in essentially cooling his heels in the parliament and his right-hand man, Dmitry Medvedev, was sitting in the presidency. 
and essentially Obama and Hillary Clinton played Medvedev and promised him that they just wanted this limited no-fly zone authority to protect the men, women, and children of Benghazi from annihilation by Gaddafi, which was a total hoax in the first place of a Acosta's belly. But anyway, the Russians went along with that, but it, of course it just served as a bait and switch. And ultimately they used that UN authorization, that Security Council authorization to launch a nine month regime change war against Gaddafi in Tripoli, which was an absolute humiliation for Medvedev. And he was gone after just one term, uh, moved to the National Security Council and Putin came back to an early return to the presidency. When, you know, they talk about this guy as such a strong man dictator. Now, he was trying out letting his right hand man take his place and then America proved that if you want a job done right, you got to do it yourself, apparently, um, by making such a chump out of Medvedev and helping bring Putin back early. Then, of course, uh, they also backed the terrorist forces, uh, just as they had in Libya, in, in really Bin Ladenite forces in Libya and in Syria. And in Syria, it finally got so bad that in 2013, they, from 2011 through 13, they supported them. 2013, the essentially Iraqi dominated faction of Al Qaeda uh, declared an Islamic state in Eastern Syria. And one year later, they rolled right into Western Iraq, conquered all of Western Iraq, created the Islamic Caliphate. And even though Obama was bombing them in Iraq, he was still supporting their sometimes friends in other bin Ladenite groups on the other side of the line in Syria, all the way through the end of his presidency. Um, although to much uh, less effect after the Russians finally intervened in the end of 2015 and carpet bombed the CIA's sock puppet terrorists there. Um, and so this was an area where after the rise of ISIS, the Obama government was actually negotiating with um, the Russians and working with them I'm sorry, I said I was doing bullet points here. People might remember John Kerry worked out a deal with the Russians that let's bomb ISIS together. And the Pentagon immediately bombed Syrian forces on the ground in the middle of fighting ISIS in order to scotch that deal. And it was taken, this was in the New York Times and what have you. This was taken officially as essentially insubordination by the Pentagon overriding the president and the secretary of state and their diplomacy with Russia. Um, on this issue in order to keep the war going. Now, uh, what the Obama government did that was worst of all on this was, well, first of all, he continued the anti-missile missiles in Poland and Romania, but he, uh, his government, led by the vice president, Joe Biden, uh, led the coup, the policy of overthrowing the government of Ukraine in 2014. Now, they call it a, and in fact, Robert Perry, the great journalist, believed that one of the main reasons that the neoconservatives led by Victoria Newland and others wanted to overthrow the government of Ukraine was just to scotch this new budding partnership between Obama and Putin. They had worked together on getting the Ayatollah to sign the nuclear deal. They were now working together in Syria. And this was for the military industrial complex and the neoconservative war party. Uh, you know, their greatest threat would be peace with Russia a real reset with Russia. And so Perry believed that was one of the main reasons that they sponsored the coup was just to make sure to break this new budding, uh, not necessarily friendship, but relationship between second term Obama and uh, Vladimir Putin as it was. Anyway, um, they did overthrow the government there. Long story short, it was American intervention. These color coded revolutions, what they are is they're violent, almost always violent coup d'etats and you know, putches uh, and, and you know, overthrows disguised as popular revolutions. And yes, you can always find some people in the street to support the one side or the other that the Americans are supporting. And that's actually the template. You get your side to refuse to recognize the results of the election they lost and just stay out in the street and riot and protest until they can figure out a way to get the new government to make concessions, hold a new election, take a co-president or whatever it is and complete the coup. And that's how they've done it over and over again. Um, that was the Ukrainian template from back in 2004. In this case, it was a dispute, um, not over an election, but over 
the president's failure to sign a trade deal with the EU and favoritism toward Russia that sparked the protest. And then the American government absolutely intervened on their behalf, along with friendly uh, billionaire uh, sponsored NGOs and this kind of thing to sponsor the coup. Now, what's important about this is Ukraine is a very ethnically divided country between East and West. Part of this is a legacy of communism from you know, the Soviet days of the Holodomor, the genocide in the 1930s against the people of Ukraine, Stalin forcibly relocating Ukrainians out of Eastern Ukraine and putting Russians there in their place. But we're talking about 80 years ago. We're talking about history long past. Um, and then part of it also is just where the lines are drawn. They've been drawn in, in very odd ways as is the case in, in many national borders in the old world. And in this case, the lines were drawn by Lenin and Stalin, uh, or I guess Lenin and Trotsky before Stalin, um, in a way that, you know, has essentially created uh, a dual nation. You know, we had uh, the um, Czech Republic and Slovakia split apart from each other. But in the case of Ukraine, somehow they are indivisible no matter what forever, when maybe they should have been divided long ago. And when you look at the election results, you can see how uh, in the last few elections, you can see how the uh, geographically divided the nation has been. So the government that was overthrown in 2014, the president was a guy named Yanukovych. He was the same guy who was overthrown in 2004, prevented from taking office, in fact, after winning the election of 2004. Well, here he won again in 2010. And but then he fails to sign this trade deal in 2013 and uh, the riots break out. Now, uh, once he's overthrown and it, he won in a democratic, a fair, free and fair election in 2010. Um, once he's overthrown, the new government almost immediately outlaws Russia. And um, which is a huge just declaration of culture war against uh, the Russian language as an official language of the culture, I should say, or, you know, in terms of government documents or education or, or anything like that. Uh, Russian as an official second language. Now they took that back, but it was still a, just a massive declaration of culture war inside of the country at the time. And then three former presidents wrote an open letter saying now is our chance to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base on Crimea. Now, the Crimean Peninsula belonged to Russia since Catherine the Great bought it from the Turks in 1783, the same year that John Adams and John Jay and Ben Franklin went over to Paris to sign the final peace at the end of the American Revolution, four years before our Constitution was ever even written, much less ratified. Um, and the only reason it belonged to Ukraine was because Khrushchev had given it to them in order to win the support of the Ukrainian Communist Party when he was in the battle to succeed Stalin after he died. And so um, ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, Crimea had remained with Ukraine uh, and essentially the status quo had remained and the Russians had kept their naval base there on a lease. And that had been that way for 24 years. It wasn't until the Obama government had overthrown the government of Ukraine twice in 10 years and that these three former presidents had said, now is our chance to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base. Only then did essentially the sailors and Marines leave their base and seize Crimea. It's what's called a coup de main, which can be one big battle, but maybe just one big maneuver. There was no battle. They just went outside and stood on the street corners and said, this is now Russian territory again. Now, is that against the law? Yes. Was it completely provoked by the Americans, the same ones who had just finished recognizing the independence of Kosovo a few years before? Yes. <laughs> um, and so, um, and, and then they held a referendum and it was verified later by German polling firms and others. It was absolutely super duper majorities. Above 80% of the population of Crimea voted to in a referendum to join the Russian Federation. Now, in the east of the country, the people who, who had in Donetsk and Luhansk, the Donbass regions called the Far East, the people who had voted for Yanukovych, the guy who'd been overthrown, said, well, if you guys can occupy the government buildings and overthrow the government, 
we can occupy the government buildings and refuse to recognize the authority of the new coup junta. So they did that. And then the new president, Poroshenko, immediately declared a war on terrorism and invaded and attacked the east of his country, complete with heavy artillery and airstrikes and just absolute atrocities. It was unbelievable what they did. And it is a fact that the Russians sent essentially deniable special operations forces across the border to help the people of the Donbass defend themselves from the onslaught. But no time back then did they invade. And when the Donbass held referendums and declared independence, the Russians essentially, you know, soft recognized it, but did not recognize them as independent countries. But they said, you know, we respect your wishes or something vague like that. And when they asked to join the Russian Federation, Putin told them yet. And the reason why was because he was working on a peace deal with the Germans and the French, the Minsk deal. And that was in the end of 2014. And then Minsk II, the successor, came in the beginning of 2015. Now, the first one ended the airstrikes and pulled back, you know, mandated pullback of the heavy equipment. And then in 2015, the Minsk II deal was supposed to really end the fighting. And the Minsk, uh, pardon me, the Kiev government was supposed to recognize uh, enhanced autonomy, essentially statehood, uh, strong federalism for the Donbass, but that they would stay inside Ukraine um, and then give them a rebuilding package and this and that. And then the Americans refused, even though they endorsed the pact, um, you know, uh, France and Germany uh, negotiated it, but America and the United Nations endorsed it officially, but they refused to ever implement it. And the fighting went on. And there are radical right-wing forces in the country many of them the proud grandsons and great-grandsons of the Galatian SS who fought for the Nazis in World War II, who played a huge role in the coup in 2014, and who have had a, have played a huge role in the militia forces fighting in the Donbass for over these last seven years. And of course, now they've mostly been integrated into the armed forces of Ukraine, and yet they remain, you know, that is who they are. But in the intervening years here, Essentially, the military had no control of these men, no ability to tell them to stop their fighting. And it would have taken American support to really get them reined in. And the Americans wouldn't support that. And anyone can look this up, this famous footage of the current president of Ukraine, Zelensky, talking to some of these guys from a militia called C-14. And that 14 is the 14 words of the slogan of the white supremacists about the future for young white children and all that stuff. That's what the 14 means. And he's meeting with these guys from C-14. And he's saying, guys, this is uh, circa three, four years ago, uh, 2019, I guess. Um, he's saying, guys, I need you to pull back to you know this town back here. Stop the fighting. I'm working on a peace deal. I ran on peace and I'm implementing the peace deal here. And they tell him, go to hell. We don't have to do what you say. And we're talking enlisted guys in a militia. They're not even officers of any kind. They're nobodies. These are boys with rifles, essentially, you know, young men in their 20s. And they're telling him, go to hell. Who are you to tell us not to fight? And he says, these are your key words to search. He says, I am not a loser. I am the president of this country. I'm 41 years old. And I'm telling you, I want you to stop this. And they just say, go to hell, dude. You can't tell us what to do at all. So there's a big part of the reason they failed to implement the Minsk II deal is they couldn't do it. They would have needed American support to do it, uh, to you know, eliminate troublemakers like that and, and help the president consolidate power over his armed forces. And they would not do that. And so uh, the fighting went on. Now, um, uh, very quickly, Donald Trump, as you all know, was framed by the Democrats, the FBI and the CIA for treason with Russia. None of it was true, none of it. It was all lies. And if you believed it, it's forgivable, I guess. Maybe you thought he was scary, but the FBI and the CIA were lying to you. But Donald Trump, of course, is a two-dimensional being. So what was his reaction to being falsely accused of treason with Russia? He poured weapons into Ukraine and said, he literally, his son said, let's see him call us pro-Russian traitors now. Yeah, that was easy. And I don't know whether Donald Trump 
either didn't control his Pentagon at all, or he was as bad on Russia as any of them. But during his reign of four years, the Pentagon increased massive military exercises in the Black and Baltic Seas and in Europe, flew massive bomber flights over and over again, nuclear bombers flying up to 12 and a half miles off of Russia's coast to light up all of their radars, essentially practicing first strike nuclear war against Russia and all of these provocations. When, and you guys might remember, he was impeached. Literally the president of the United States was impeached for the third time in our history for temporarily holding up an arms deal to Ukraine that then he let go through anyway. The Ukrainians said they didn't even notice the delay. Um, and he was impeached by the Democrats for that. <clears throat> and it was, he was asking for some political interference. He wanted them to investigate Joe and his son, Hunter Biden's involvement in Ukraine, which absolutely was corrupt and criminal. Why was the vice president's son on the board of directors of this gas company? Why was Kofor Black, the former CIA counterterrorism director, on this, the board of directors of this company? The answer is because Burisma, which was owned by Kolomoisky, the oligarch who was the primary sponsor of the current president, Zelensky, at least previously, he was in tight with the previous government that had been overthrown and was worried that the new government was then now going to persecute and tax it, right? So what did he do? Did he hire the nephew of the new prime minister or the brother of the new president? No, he hired the son of the vice president of the United States, the guy who held the Ukraine brief in the Obama government and led the coup. And we know that because Victoria Newland, who was caught red-handed plotting the coup on by the Russians and leaked on YouTube, two weeks before the coup even happened in early February, 2015, she says, I just talked to Jake Sullivan, that's Joe Biden's national security advisor, then and now, and I just talked to Sullivan and he says the vice president is willing. We're gonna get him on the phone on a conference call with all the participants to give them a final attaboy and to make it stick, to make the deets stick, she says. OK, so they knew to protect themselves. Go to Joe Biden's son, who's in town, you know, panhandling. So that was where that came from. Now, of course, the media will censor this. Maybe the YouTube might yank this because you have to say on orders from, I don't know, God's God, that whenever you discuss the investigations into Joe Biden's son, you have to say dormant like a volcano, dormant. Dormant, dormant, dormant. You're not allowed to use any other term to describe these investigations. They were dormant. Like that hole Saddam was, was hiding in in 2004, that was a spider hole. You're not allowed to say it was a hole. You're not allowed to say it was a ditch. You're not allowed to say it was a bunker. It was a spider hole, okay? Well, these investigations, they were dormant, damn you, dormant. Except that they weren't. That was a lie. In fact, there were all different investigations going on into Burisma. When Joe Biden, as he bragged on C-SPAN at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, he leaned on the president of Ukraine to fire the attorney general who had all these open, not dormant investigations into Burisma, possibly including the role of the vice president's son on that board. And Biden bragged that he told them, you better fire this attorney general or you'll get no more aid from us. Well, I won't give you that billion dollars I was going to give you, billion dollars I was going to give you. And then as he put it, lo and behold, an hour later they came and said he's been fired. And then if you say that, they go, no, -uh, he was fired because of corruption. Really, because the guy who's replaced by was 10 times more corrupt than the guy that got fired. And that was the whole thing of it. So it really is, you know, quite unfortunate here that, you know, what we needed with Trump was a return to normalcy from the craziness of the world empire after the end of the Cold War. We were supposed to return to normalcy like Harding returned to normalcy after World War I, right? But instead, we got Donald Trump, the basket case lunatic, which set the narrative that a return to normalcy meant going back to Joe Biden, going back to crazy from loony. So here we are with you know, these people who are the ones who you know, drove us into this corner 
who pushed this policy. And now they're the only ones we have. Joe Biden and Jake Sullivan and Victoria Newland are the one calling the shots right now. Now they can't admit to each other, much less to you and I, that, okay, this is like kind of our fault. And maybe we pushed it a little too far. Maybe we could have found a better way to, nah, uh, uh. They can never do that. So instead, what's their narrative? As Condoleezza Rice put it, Putin woke up on the wrong side of the bed one morning and now he's got a mental illness. He's not the Vladimir Putin I know. He's the new crazy Vladimir Putin who does crazy things that can't be explained. And you're just supposed to accept that. Unprovoked, they say. It's just like the spider hole, just like the dormant investigations. Unprovoked attack, unprovoked attack, unprovoked attack. You're not allowed to call it an attack without calling it an unprovoked attack. Well, it's an aggressive war. Vladimir Putin launched an invasion of Ukraine. But why do you got to lie and say it was unprovoked? They provoked it. And that's why they say that. They want to make it, you know, essentially a thought crime beyond, you know, the social stigma you're willing to carry that you would say that, no, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than Putin is trying to restore the glory of the lost Russian empire. As he put it in his speech at the end of February, he said, listen, the communists drew these wacky borders in the first place. Khrushchev gave away Crimea under these odd circumstances. Then Gorbachev gives away total independence to Ukraine, which Putin is lamenting. But he's saying, you know what? What are you going to do? It is what it is. They got their independence. But then he says, but it turns out there's no such thing as Ukrainian independence. The Americans insist on taking it. But we can't have that. So if it can't be independent, it's going to belong to us, not you. Now, that doesn't make it right. But that does make it provoked. And that does make it entirely a separate narrative from what they're trying to, let, to lead us to believe on TV about the nature of this conflict. And by the way, even for people who don't know anything about this really at all, when it just became this huge news story at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And then when the Russians invaded in February, didn't each and every one of you think that, well, now we're going to have some kind of diplomatic full court press to try to stop the fighting. We can't have a war on Russia's border where we're up to our eyeballs in this kind of conflict of interest in the thing. We can't. Didn't you think all the diplomats were going to race to Geneva? that the war would go on for a week or so and then we'd figure something out and negotiate? And they haven't even tried. Our Secretary of State hasn't talked to their foreign minister since February the 15th, and which is treason against all of mankind. How dare they play with this level of danger right on Russia's very border? In the old Cold War, we drew the line at the Elbe River halfway across Germany. When there was an uprising in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in Poland, Eisenhower, LBJ, and Reagan said, tough, you're east of the line. We're not coming for you. Now, but you Reds, if you come into West Germany, you threaten France or Britain, we'll go to nuclear war. You better not cross that line. And of course, the Reds understood that and they weren't coming across that line. Andrew Coburn showed they had a week worth of gasoline. There was no threat to Western Europe in the first place. But anyway, that was the deal. Now we have moved that line. The United States of America has moved that line 1,200 miles to the east, right to Russia's border. You look at the map, Kharkiv is 300 miles due south of Moscow. You know, it's not a straight line, that border. Ukraine kind of, again, that's a funny shaped line. Um, so now here we are six months into the war and with American coordination, CIA and special operations forces on the ground, according to the New York Times, helping coordinate the whole war. 
armed and trained up on our weapons. The Ukrainians on the weekend of September 10th and 11th had a major victory in northern Luhansk, in the area around Kharkiv. And east of there, all the way almost right up to the Russian border. Um, at the same time, they had to launch a major diversionary attack near Kherson, northwest of Crimea on the southern coast, almost to Odessa, in order to uh, divide Russian forces so they were able to achieve that victory. But a victory they did achieve at great cost, but they did. And that then is what led to the recent scale up of tensions where Putin somewhat humiliated had to say, okay, fine, Roger that you want to do play it that way. And, you know, make it this difficult for me. Well, I'll just have to try that much harder. And he called up 300,000 reserves. Now in the Western propaganda, they go, oh, yeah, they're going to be sending, you know, barefoot, you know, unarmed young men into combat or whatever. But that's not right. What that means is the, the active duty forces all over the rest of Russia will be able to deploy now to the war while the reserves fill in for them, say in Siberia, you know, on the frontier with China or wherever else, whatever other active duty that they have, the reserves will now be able to fill in for them. So the Russians have a 400,000 man army. They've deployed about 120, 140,000 men so far. And we don't know what it's going to look like, but taking into consideration Putin's so-called annexation of all of Kherson, Saporia, Donetsk, and Luhansk now, a major, major portion of the east of the country, and including areas west of the Dnieper River there in the south, then, I mean, it sounds like they're going to need a major occupation force to, one, well, a major, you know, military force to crush the Ukrainian military to prevent them from continuing to war against them and trying to force them out, and then two, just an occupation force to hold it down after that. So this is, again, uh, as I said at the beginning, a massive escalation by Putin, not just in calling up the reserves and in you know uh, expanding conscription in the country, but in declaring these parts of eastern Ukraine now Russian soil. He has set the stage for a potential major conflict with NATO. Now, I mean... It's just absolutely simple enough. Joe Biden should negotiate. The Americans are the ones, again, Putin did start this war. He should be rewarded for it, as they say, and all that. But it's the Americans, really, who got the Ukrainians into this mess. You know, back in 2015, John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, the dean of the realist school of foreign policy, the real politic guys, not non-interventionist peaceniks, and not, liberta not uh, liberal humanitarians, but the Henry Kissinger guys, right? The, the hard-nosed real politics. Mearsheimer said, America is leading Ukraine down the primrose path, and they're going to get wrecked. In other words, America was making promise to, promises to this country. You and him go fight. I got your back. But what that really means is, I'll march you right into a minefield. And by have your back, I mean, I'm going to lead from behind and stay back here, send you some trucks and some artillery pieces. Um, and then now look at what's happened. It's uh, We already knew this from uh, Ukrainian Pravda. That's not the Russian Pravda. It's a different organization altogether. Ukrainian Pravda reported this a month ago that in April... Boris Johnson came and ruined negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. And we now know from the recent issue of Foreign Affairs magazine that Fiona Hill, uh, the Russia hawk, in her recent piece confirms that Ukraine, in fact, develops the story further. Ukraine and Russia had a deal in principle. Get this. The Russians would withdraw entirely from Ukraine, including the Donbass if the Ukrainian government would agree to truly implement Minsk to end the fighting in the East once and for all and four square entry into the NATO military alliance. Perhaps they would have had to amend their constitution to 
forever forswear NATO membership, something like that. And the Americans came, Fiona Hill now confirms in foreign affairs, the Americans through uh, their sock puppet, Boris Johnson, uh, quashed those negotiations, destroyed those negotiations, told the Ukrainians, if you sign this, you'll never get a dime from us or another gun from us ever again. And ended it. And in fact, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the footnote on me, but I know uh, Dave DeCamp said this, so it must be right, that Boris Johnson himself took credit for that and admitted that that was true, that he had intervened in those negotiations. So yeah. this war could have been over and we'd have gone back to the status quo ante. Right, you get to keep the Donbass in uh, all of it. I mean, you're not getting Crimea back, but <clears throat> going back to the status quo ante, all you got to do is forswear NATO membership and truly implement the peace deal. And now here we are after another few months of helping them, and it looks like they've lost the entire east of their country permanently. Now I hate to see what another six months of help for Ukraine will bring them. And I guess I'll end it there because I already did go on way too long. But that's why this is all Bill Clinton's fault is because at the end of the Cold War, America should have abolished the NATO military alliance. You know, there's talk of bringing Russia into NATO. Well, or pointing NATO at their throat. How about neither? How about America be a humble little commercial constitutional republic and leave the world the hell alone? In the Cold War, the excuse was we are here to protect you from global communism. Well, when there's not global communism, what are we here to protect you from now? Pirates, the rock, and give me a break. America is the evil empire now, and we could just abandon it, come home, and in almost every case around the world where we leave, there's every incentive for peace to break out. It ain't utopia, it ain't magic, but look at what happens when we even talk about pulling out of the Middle East. Immediately, Saudi and UAE start talking to Iran, not threatening them worse, talking to them. And that's, I'm sure, the way it's, it would be in East Asia as well if we get out of there. Everyone has, you know, America's military power gives pipsqueaks courage that they don't deserve, right? Like, this is why we don't supposedly don't promise to defend Taiwan. Because if we do, then Taiwan will declare independence because they know we've got their back. And so bring it on, China. Go ahead and attack us. Otherwise, they'd never declare independence because they know the Chinese would attack. And the Americans promising to protect them incentivizes them to get us into a war. And that's the same kind of thing that we have here. I don't know if you guys saw uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, his aide, said, you know, because the Russians have threatened numerous times to use nuclear weapons in this war. They have threatened that. And he said, well, before the Russians even think about using nuclear weapons, the other nuclear powers, including obviously meaning the United States and Britain, et cetera, should launch a first strike nuclear attack against Russia. We demand it, he said. Um, I'm sorry. I don't want to get into a nuclear war over Ukraine. And to tell you the truth, if I have a dog in this fight, I'm on Ukraine's side. My wife is from Odessa. She and her family, they're beside themselves of what's happening here. But I'm supposed to trade Austin, Texas for Odessa and then lose Odessa anyway? Sorry, I'm afraid not. This whole thing is completely crazy. And it's just a tragedy that American opinion is so distracted and divided by so many things. We can't even agree that this is the most important thing in the world, whether or not we're going to have a nuclear war with Russia that could erase our civilization from the face of the earth in a day. And instead, we're talking about trans bathrooms, this, and Mexican immigration, that, and who's going to fly me for my abortion, and all these things. When we could all be dead by Christmas, and we can't get people to even form a consensus around the idea that this is what matters the most. And because why, right? A big part of it is because our side has to take some responsibility and we'd rather all die than that, huh? OK. 
Okay. Well, now I'll have some Dr. Pepper. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to take moderator's prerogative here and just ask a couple of things. One of the things that I find so frustrating, and Chomsky talks about this all the time, is that the, the parameters of debate in this country are become so narrow that's part of what's creating the problem that you just finished describing at the end of your talk, right? We're, we're worried about trivialities when the real problem is staring us in the face. That's just an observation. I've wondered, there was an argument made in the 90s for why NATO attacked Serbia, and it was called Article 51. There was no liability to Western Europe from what was going on in Serbia. It was terrible, but it wasn't a causus belli. They went anyway, using Article 51. And as I learn more and more about the horrific nature of what the Azovs and the right sectors and the C C fourteens and all those people were do, have been doing to the Donbass the fourteen thousand dead Russian speakers. Why is Article fifty one not appropriate from Putin's point of view? I mean that that they never, I haven't heard that said out loud. It seems almost trivial to mention it, given. Yeah. Ever well, they deny your facts, right? I mean, they would just say whatever was happening in the Donbass was Russia's fault, not theirs, and turn it around, of course. But, you know, in his declaration of war in February, he very deliberately paraphrased Bill Clinton on Kosovo, W. Bush on Iraq, and Barack Obama on Libya. In, um, he paraphrased Bill Clinton, talking about the necessity of guaranteeing the independence for Kosovo. Um, because of the ethnic persecution going on there. He paraphrased W. Bush invoking weapons of mass destruction because Zelensky had said, well, if nobody's going to abide by the Budapest memorandum, maybe we won't either. And that was a very slight euphemism for uh, we'll disregard our previous promise to forswear nuclear weapons. Now, obviously, this is a thin pretext. Ukraine can't make a nuke without the Russians being able to bomb it for months before they get anywhere near that, right? Same situation Iran is in right now. Um, so it's just talk, but Putin paraphrased it and invoked it, said, oh, weapons of mass destruction. I don't need a UN resolution, man. I'm threatened with weapons of mass destruction here. You hear that? And then he quoted Obama on Libya. Responsibility to protect. The civilians are in danger, which, of course, was a total lie in uh in Libya when Obama made that up, just as Bill Clinton lied about the 100,000 Kosovar Albanians that had supposedly been exterminated by the Serbs. It was an outright fabrication, no more real than Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons there. Um, but he knew exactly what he was doing. He and his speechwriters knew exactly what he was doing. He invoked three American presidents in a row for their shoddy excuses for violating international law and launching an aggressive war and said essentially, yeah, that's right, pal. If you guys can do it, then I can do it too. Right. The Maddox was attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. The Contras were freedom fighters and there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Yep. Okay. So um, I didn't have a chance to test out the microphone, but if anybody has any questions, there is a microphone right here and it's just sitting on this chair at the moment. Does anybody want to speak up and ask Scott a question? You want to come up? Can you hear me? Can you hear him, Scott? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Go ahead. 
So currently, it seems like Putin's ready to negotiate, um, but the West is and Zelensky are are not, especially after the referendums <clears throat> and Russia's recognition. What do you think gets both parties to the table? Do you think it's a decisive strike, or do you think it's economic damage to the West, or do you think it's Russian losses, what, or a combination of some of those? Uh, you know, um, and it's a good question. I think, you know, a lot of the news about how bad the Russians are doing, I think a lot of it must be right. But overall, at the end of the day, you just look at the size of the countries and look at their manufacturing capability and look at the number of men that they have to field into battle. Time is on Russia's side. I just think that's unavoidable. Um, you know, technology is not everything. And they've been fighting just an artillery war since not exactly the very beginning, but pretty close. Or it's just carpet bombing with artillery, essentially, just a slow, steady, trod, uh, grinding up the Ukrainian armed forces the way that they have. So um, I think the Russians... I mean, especially now, I think what you said about their willingness to negotiate, I think has expired, right? I don't think they're taking back the annexation of these provinces. I think they were willing to negotiate up to and including last week. Right now, I don't think they're willing to uh, entertain giving back any of what they now have claimed to take for themselves. And now, whether they have the ability to hold all of it, I really don't know how that's going to play out, I, I've got to say. Um, but they're willing to talk. And then, so now on the other side of that equation, the Americans, the Ukrainians, they're going to now negotiate when the Russians are going to be absolutely intransigent on their absorption of what a third of the nation like this. Right. I mean, Putin really screwed everybody here with this thing, man. It makes sense from his point of view, I guess, if he just figures they won't negotiate with him anyway. He's just determined to win. So he's staking his claim and going for it. And if the world goes to hell, I guess we all go to hell. But so then that means that what we have to hope for is that Biden will swallow his pride at the end of the day and go home. Same way they left Iraq and same way they left Afghanistan. That's what America does. We lose wars and then we leave an ignominious retreat and then go and blow up somebody else's country to make ourselves feel better about it. So, um, I mean, I think, I hate to say that it, it seems like the if there was a time for negotiation to succeed, they blew it, man, and we're past that now. I think with, uh, with, with the annexations here, it just makes it so much more difficult to imagine them actually going through with it and, and sitting down. And because, of course, you know, they believe, too, that that they're winning. The Russians are about to lose any day now. They've said every day for the last six months. So um, when everybody believes that they're in the position of strength, nobody wants to concede a thing. So I don't know. And it sucks because both sides have about 6,000 hydrogen bombs, in case anyone forgot. Thank you. Uh -oh. Can I talk? No. Sure. Anybody else? Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, the, the Pentagon, the RAND Corporation, um, for, for quite a few years have been wargaming the situation. And um, have been promoting that to the, the executive branch of, of how easy this would be, a walk in the park, just as uh, w was promised that Iraq would be a walk in the park and um, 
they these things have not gone according to the plan, even though you know they were thinking they could take out seven countries in five years and right right yeah and in fact so for people who haven't read it i mean I, I strongly urge everyone to look at the rand corporation website and there's the short version and the long version of a study from 2019 called extending russia you know what that means is overextending russia baiting russia into doing stupid stuff giving russia too many problems to handle and it goes from the kind of obvious and banal, like, let's try to spike, you know, crash the oil price to let's do another color coded revolution in Belarus. Let's pour arms into the radical right wing forces in Ukraine. Let's start rearming the bin Ladenite suicide bombers in Syria. Let's see what we can do to weaken Russia's relationship with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And remember, there was apparently an American or Turkish or somebody back attempted coup in Kazakhstan in just in January of this year, right when they're telling Putin, hey, man, you better not invade Ukraine. We don't mean you any harm. Everybody knows that. And then it sure looks like it was American and their Turkish allies or something along those lines were intervening in Kazakhstan right during that. And, and so now if you read that, on all of them, again, it's called extending Russia. And the way they talk about it is, ma'am, you're exactly right. They say, well, listen, when we pour all these arms in, we have to carefully calibrate the amount of weapons that we pour in because we want to make sure to get this kind of reaction out of Russia, but not that kind. We want them to double down their war in Ukraine, but we don't want them to really invade. We don't want because see that would cost them a lot. And that would be beneficial to us, but it would also cost us too. And of course, probably cost a lot of Ukrainian lives. That's like kind of in parentheses there, kind of an afterthought. It's interesting the way they write it because it is. It's you know the Rand Corporation is this think tank that's sponsored by the Pentagon, but it's out in Santa Barbara where it's supposed to be sort of pseudo independent. But it's written like a government agency advice. So really, on the Ukraine part, it really is like. Okay, if we escalate in Ukraine, um, you know, here are all the things we could do. We could put in all these anti-tank missiles and we could escalate, you know, in other ways, diplomatically, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the consequences of this for Russia would, could be really severe. And then they list all the ways that this could really hurt Russia. And they make it sound good, like if you're a hawk. Oh, it's going to cost them all this money and it's going to destabilize Putin's government when you got Russians coming home in body bags and he's got to try to explain it and all of these things. And then the next paragraph says, you know, by the way, like if you took our advice from the previous paragraph, you might get us all killed in a full scale war with Russia. That would be one of the risks. So, you know what I mean? Hey, we're just saying we're not really recommending you do these things. We're just telling you these are things you could do. But in fact, we're actually telling you that maybe you probably shouldn't do those things because the consequences could be severe. But then if you actually look at the policy of Trump and then especially into the Biden government, it's like they took all of the here's the terrible stuff you could do and they ignored all the warnings. And they just said, yeah, let's try to overthrow Belarus. Let's try to overthrow Kazakhstan. Let's pour weapons into Ukraine. Let's bring Zelensky to Washington one year ago and put promise again that he's on the fast track to Ukraine. Let's tell the New York Times that we're standardizing his military with our NATO alliance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All like they say to do in there in order to provoke the Russians into overreacting. You know, I'm just reading this book right now. Today, I sat down finally to read this book, Human Smoke about the run-up to World War II. And there's just all kinds of insane stuff in here. Don't even get me started. This entire planet of lunatics that we live on here. But one of the things was they say, uh, this is the, one of the things I was just reading. It's summer of 1941. And not only are they selling uh, a few score, I forget, a few dozen, uh, bombers to China, to Chiang Kai-shek, to use against Japan, they put in the newspaper. And they have this big write-up in some telegram that is certain to be intercepted. 
where they go, yeah, we're going to rain fire on those chaps now. They're, their cities are made of paper and wood. It's going to be so much fun watching them burn, this and that. When they knew the Japanese were going to intercept it. That was why they did it. They were extending Japan. Trying to provoke Japan into doing something stupid. So they had an excuse to get into the war. And he's got a great quote there from Churchill too saying, yeah, I just got back from meeting with Roosevelt. He said he's doing everything he can to provoke the, Jap the Japanese into attacking them so he can come and save us here in Europe, et cetera, like that. And that's exactly the kind of business. I, I urge everyone to read, if you got the patience for it, download and read the PDF file of the long version. There's like the PowerPoint presentation, the summary. There's the long version, the 2000 or, you know, whatever, a uh, uh, 20,000 word, thing 200 page pdf extending russia and crawl into the mindset of these american professional foreign policy analysts of here instead of like you, couldn't you have a whole rand study that's called how to get along with russia they ain't perfect but let's be friends it ain't like they're the soviet union anymore no you can't have that it has to be how can we stick it to them every possible way that we can just relentless and with very little self-awareness. And as I say, where they are self-aware and warn against their own bad advice, it seems like Biden only took their bad advice and ignored all their warnings against their own stupid stuff. I, I also have a question about um, the recent um, uh, sabotage of um, Nord Stream 1 and 2. Uh-huh. Um, it's been said that NATO's creation was to uh, keep the USN and Russia out and Germany down. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether this recent action there might be accomplishing so many of those actions, because Germany is certainly in an awful si situation now. Well, um, so look, I mean, all we can do is speculate, right? It could have been the Poles although I don't think they would have done it without American help. I don't think it was the Russians. The Russians, I think, want to sell that gas. Um, the German, on the other hand, the Americans have succeeded in pressuring the Germans into turning the thing off. They weren't getting any gas out of there, and they probably were not going to return to getting any gas out of there at any time in the foreseeable future. But you could argue that whoever was you know, uh, committing those acts was trying to make sure that we can't go back to the way things were. You know, the um, the great libertarian economist from the mid 19th century, uh, Frederick Bastiat, the Frenchman, said, "Where goods do not cross borders, soldiers will." And so, then the opposite of that is, hey, where we're trading back and forth, that helps to keep the peace. You know, you've heard of this democratic peace theory. That's not what it is. It's the international trade peace theory. These countries dependent on each other keeps them from fighting with each other. Although sometimes the trade blocks go to war with each other. Like that's really what happened in World War I in a way. Um, but free trade or freer trade, whatever, extended trade between nations keeps the peace. For example... Look at how much pressure there is to keep the peace between us and China right now because of these zillion dollar investments back and forth between our nation and theirs that would all be in jeopardy in the event of a violent conflict. It helps keep us from violent conflict. Now, and in fact, you have the military industrial complex firms who they benefit only from conflict. But you have all the rest of these firms that are invested in China who benefit from the peace and would rather keep the peace. So. I believe that actually one of the reasons that Biden preferred to see war in Ukraine was because he wanted to see the peace pipeline, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline canceled. And the Germans had essentially made it clear that America go to hell. We are not canceling the pipeline unless, of course, like Russia invades Ukraine. If they go that far, then I guess we will. And then that's what happened. And that led to the um, collapse of the pipeline. And then just as you say, I believe it was... I can't remember anymore. It was British Lord, somebody or other, who had coined that phrase. It was their, that was their point of view, that the purpose of NATO was to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. And so think about it. 
Why do the Germans need NATO if they're better and better friends with Russia all along? And why should they take orders from us, have us stand in as their military force, essentially, and dictate their foreign policy for them if they don't need us to protect them from the Russians? They're friends with the Russians. Well, uh, good question. But if we can end that and prevent that friendship and, uh, you know, keep the relationship more hostile, then that works in America's interest. Now they even got Finland and Sweden trying to join the alliance where before they would not. And so, and then I don't know if you guys read Vladimir Putin's speech from yesterday, but it's a hell of a thing, but it's essentially announcing a full break, you know, he's announcing the annexation of these territories. But he's also essentially announcing a full break with the Western order that, you know, all his last 20 years of trying to be part of Europe are over. Hell, he's just going to turn east and do business with everybody else instead. And um, yeah, today's the first day of the rest of all of our lives kind of situation here. It's a new day for, um, and, and look, this has been happening for a long time. Even the worst of the war party, Charles Krauthammer in 1991, he wrote, this is our unipolar moment. Not we get to rule the world forever. It was right now we are so much more powerful than everyone else. We can set the world the way we want it to be in terms of the rules going forward, right? <clears throat> but the idea was not that we get to be the dominant military power over the entire earth from now on. That never work, right? And so what's happened is, of course, we had the idiot boy emperor come in in the ultimate irony, right? The first month of the first year of the new millennium. And you have a guy with the IQ of like 87 sitting in the chair and just absolutely ruins everything. It takes America's entire wad and blows it on the worthless desert sand of Iraq. And it's been all downhill for American imperial power and influence in the world since 2003. And yet, what do they do? They kind of lash out, throw these temper tantrums, act like it ain't over yet. You know what, frankly? I'm feeling this myself, right? Like I'm 46. Today I got reading glasses. Don't I look like 20 years older in these things? Um, I still skate vert, but not as well as I used to. My, I, I, I try to tell myself that I can still, you know, but yeah, I'm, um, I'm not getting in, I'm not getting drunk and getting in fist fights at the bar to make up for it. That's what America is doing, right? I am not getting old and weak and tired and going out and getting trashed and getting in fights with younger, tougher guys like the Taliban who can kick their ass. Um, so, but listen, I, it, but you know, the good news then though is it doesn't have to be this way, right? We just don't have to do this. We could, we could just give up on world hegemony, be a constitutional Republic with a Thomas Jeffersonian foreign policy. And, uh, and then we'd be fine. And then the Russians could be part of Europe and, and be fine too. I'm afraid that where we are right now is in the same position that Athens, Rome, Constantinople, the Portuguese Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Empire, the British, all of them were just, I, I don't know how to reverse the historical imperatives dictated by the decline of all the empires that have come before us. The only one that got away with it to some degree were the British who decided to give up the empire and maintain democracy at home. I don't know right. of any empire that has taken that path. And yep. so anyway, well, listen, it's, it's um, 2022. What the fuck's going on? thanks very much for your time, Scott. It's been a real pleasure to have you speak to us. Um, I guess I want to tell whoever's left that Scott's available on YouTube. The Scott Horton show is on YouTube. You can pick it up anytime. He's got 6,000 interviews out there along the lines of what you heard tonight. So again, thank you very much. All right. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Okay. Take care. Well, uh, what's, what's your name, brother? 
Scott Horton. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.